Oh, what's this? Zenni's 3D virtual try-on. Pretty cool, right? Wait, are those prices real? Do they have glasses for men? Yep, they also have affordable blue light glasses. Seriously? At those prices? Get them all. I like where this is going. Zenni.com. Prescription glasses starting at $6.95. There are two versions of William Butler Yeats's A Vision, one from 1925 and the other from 1937. The original 1925 edition is dedicated to Vestigia, which is an abbreviation of the magical motto for Moyna Mathers, Vestigia non retrorsum, which is, I never retrace my steps. She never did go back in her life, but kept moving forward despite whatever came her way. And I'm very excited to finally get a copy of the 25 edition of A Vision again. Back in my days teaching at the temple, I would give a workshop on Yeats's vision theory based on both of the versions extant and all of that was lost or taken and uh, I have to put together those courses again in the future and I look forward to doing that with a lot of relish so here's a little step into that because I've never had access to the critical edition before can't get these as pdfs or well, if you can, they cost you a small fortune. There's a trend in academic publishing to charge hundreds of dollars for an ebook version of something that only costs maybe a hundred dollars, like this book. One, a vision appeared in the dead of winter. On January 15th, 1926, the London publisher T. Werner Lorry distributed to subscribers 600 signed copies of W. B. Yeats's occult mythography. As recently as the previous July, William Butler Yeats had indulged in high-flown hope for it, telling Laurie, I dare say I delude myself in thinking this book my book of books. However, Laurie and WBY had long known that, as Yeats mentioned understatedly in March 1923, the book is entirely unlike any other book work of mine, and will not appeal to the same public. That is certainly true. There's an interesting part of Golden Dawn initiation where after the initial years of Adeptus, you have to, as your work, create your own system. And the theory has largely been that Yeats's was the Celtic Mysteries, but he never finished it. And he certainly didn't progress through the system he made to the same point at which he had gone spiritually in the Golden Dawn. So that stands to reason that that wasn't his completed work that led him to Adeptus Exemptus in the Stella Matutina. And I think it's easy to argue that a vision is that work, despite it coming from a collaborative effort with his wife, Georgie Hyde-Lees, and uh, through automatic writing, which still is one of my favorite tools. They estimated correctly that a limited print run would be best but could you imagine finding one of those limited signed uh, initial runs today? That would be a wonderful thing to find. It cost you tens of thousands, no doubt. A Vision was a handsome volume with light blue paper boards, parchment half binding, wood cuts by Edmund Dulac, printed on brown paper and untrimmed pages, with one striking diagram of historical cones in both red and black ink. It was appropriately expensive, selling for three pounds six. It was reviewed by Yeats's old friend and fellow mystic A.E. and seemed to disappear soon afterward. By spring, Yeats wrote to Olivia Shakespeare, and that was actually, I believe, the first woman he slept with when he was 28. They were lovers for a time, and she was also in the order that the book's reception reminds me of the stones I used to drop as a child into a certain very deep well. The splash is very far off and very faint. <laughs> Certainly echoed through eternity, though, hasn't it? The lack of response does not seem to have disturbed him, however. Yeats ends the letter to Shakespeare, fantasizing whimsically about founding an Irish heresy, with his few readers on his side of the Irish Sea. Interestingly, a tone approaching levity pervades much of his correspondence about the book, both before and after publication. To some degree, such a tone is attributable to simple relief. 
Yeats had been compiling and composing the book for years, struggling to get the philosophy right, the structure intelligible, the prose understandable, the details consistent. It had taken nearly ten years to receive, sort through, and present the system outlined in the book. That system had brought with it extraordinary changes in his life and work, and it had been no easy task to come to terms with it at all. By 1925, upward of 10,000 manuscript and typed pages of queries, replies, notes, outlines, charts, diagrams, drafts, revisions, and corrected proofs, including nearly 4,000 pages of automatic script, AS, 400 pages in journals, 600 alphabetized index cards, and over 2,000 sheets of handwritten as well as scribally typed drafts, stand testament to the difficulty of arriving at 256 published pages. As Yeats put it to Lori, getting a book of this sort into print is a reverse of the Christian miracle, for one has to turn twelve basketfuls of fragments into, is it not, two loaves and two little fishes, a greater miracle than the other. Neither Yeats nor others were sure if a vision contained profound truths and creative genius, or if it had been a ridiculous exercise in obsession. As it was being delivered to booksellers, Yeats wrote to Laurie that he was waiting for the book with some excitement, as I don't know whether I am a goose that has hatched a swan, or a swan that has hatched a goose. It might be answered that Yeats was neither a goose nor a swan, but a heron, a hern, or a hern, as W.B. Yeats sometimes spelled it in uh, the drafts, one of the figures of the phantasmagoria of characters, authors, redactors, and players in the drama that swirls around the philosophical matter of the book. Owen Ahern and his associate Michael Robartes, fictional characters revived from the trio of occult stories Rosa Alchemica, The Tables of the Law, and The Adoration of the Magi, written over two decades earlier for inclusion in The Secret Rose, 1897, were at one stage meant to speak the philosophy in a dialogue that Yeats worked on for several years before finally abandoning it in favor of the discursive form of the published book. This form retained the dynamism of the system which depended upon its dialogic arrival. In fact, the story of a vision is riddled with dialogues and doubles, beginning with the collaboration between Yeats and his wife, Georgie, which took place in spiritualistic sessions of automatic writing and other methods, which will be explained below, during which he asked questions and she wrote the answers that came to her from regions beyond the grave and outside material existence. The spiritualist nature of the automatic script also presumes a second kind of dialogue between the human partners and a host of instructors and communicators of various supernatural kinds who wrote or spoke through Georgie's hand or voice as she acted as a medium of their revelations. Writing the book was another exercise in dialogism, as Yeats strained to find adequate ways to explain material of which he was frequently in less than perfect command. He found, as readers of A Vision also find, that the relationship between writer and text, that is, authorship itself, is more than usually unstable in this book. The author is not a unified entity. There is both explanation and instruction, argument and agreement, a sense of monologue or even diatribe, as well as a sense of conversation, or even just several voices speaking all at once. Finally, the book called A Vision in, is two books. The 1925 book here presented was followed after over a decade of revision by a second book of the same title, published by Macmillan in 1937. It is so different from the earlier text that it may effectively be regarded as a separate work. Some sections were kept intact, but others were added, dropped, or radically changed, and a new and large body of introductory material changes the feel of the book as a whole. The general editors of the collected works of W.B. Yeats have wisely decided to present A Vision, 1937, here abbreviated as AVB, in a separate volume from this one, here abbreviated as AVA. The later vision is less deceptive than this earlier one. It is more philosophical and smoother in presentation. AVA is more personal and eccentric, again like the phantasmagoria of such characters as Robartes and Ahern 
play major roles in the hoax that surrounds the explication of the system. A session of automatic script from January 1918, soon after the experiments began and at roughly the time that Yeats began to write the first drafts of the dialogue between the two characters, explained why the poet was warned against studying philosophy as he started to compose. Quote, I warn you against the philosophy that is bred in stagnation. It is a bitter philosophy, a philosophy which destroys. I give you one which leads. I give you one which is from outside, a light which you follow, not one which will burn you. The Rabarti's Ahern dialogues had another purpose, to deflect the outside reader from intuiting the most insensitive of the dialogues at work. They allowed Georgie to remain in the background with her role in the project a secret, as she and the instructors insisted. On 4 March 1918, for example, the injunction came that they do not wish the spirit source revealed, and that Yeats, when writing, should, quote, only speak of those actual machineries of the philosophy that may be in the book. Although dramatized speakers were finally unworkable, a number of distancing devices remain in layers of personae, stories, and thinly veiled hoaxes from frontispiece to final poem. Edmund Dulac created the frontispiece of Giraldus, the supposed author of a book outlining the system, entitled in bad and misspelled Latin, Speculum Angelorum et Hominorum. Dulac's woodcut of a sly-looking visage in a turban, which bears a strong resemblance to Yeats as well as a slight one to Georgie, faces the title page of a vision, where textual convention places a portrait of the author. Yeats was very pleased with the image, writing to Dulac that he even doubted Quote, if Laurie would have taken the book but for the amusing deceit that your designs make possible. Others enjoyed the deceit as well. Frank Pierce Sturm, one of very few serious readers of A Vision, wrote admiringly to Yeats that every book I pick up seems to speak with the voice of W.B. Giraldus of Cones and Gyres. A tongue-in-cheek tone punctuates the book, ironically revealing in his most occult work an aspect of Yeats that is most often hidden. An inclination toward humor, even in the spiritual system that is at the same time a dreadfully serious matter. In All Souls' Night, the poem appended as a coda to the book, the poet declares, I have mummy truths to tell, whereat the living mock, though not for sober ear, for maybe all that hear, should weep and laugh an hour upon the clock. A vision has certainly caused some readers to laugh and others, or maybe the same ones, to weep. It is comedy and tragedy, a grave and playful, poetic and geometric, concrete and abstract, earnest and slippery work, aiming to be all at once a work of theoretical history, an esoteric philosophy, an aesthetic symbology, a psychological schema, and a sacred book. It is as difficult as it is essential reading for any student of Yeats. George Mills Harper, one of the early scholarly proponents of Yeats's occult interests and general editor of the four-volume edition of the automatic script and related materials, declared the unwieldy work, quote, the most maligned and misunderstood tour de force in the history of modern literature. Richard Elman, one of the few critics of Georgie, allowed to examine the vision materials after her husband's death, called it the strangest work written by a great poet in English since Blake's prophetic books. R.F. Foster, <laughs> he's a fun guy, remarks in his authoritative biography that a vision not only provides necessary illumination for a key section of Yeats's oeuvre, but that the book's real value is to students of Yeats's mind and of his aspirations. If you don't know the two-volume definitive biography of Yeats by Foster, they are beautiful, and I miss my copies greatly. Many of Yeats's literary texts are indeed enmeshed in the net cast by a vision, from well-known poems such as Leda and the Swan and The Second Coming, to the volumes Michael Rabartes and the Dancer and the Tower, to plays like The Only Jealousy of Emer and Calvary, to sections of the autobiography including The Trembling of the Veil, and even to W.B.Y.'s published version of his Nobel acceptance speech. A vision is also a work that provides 
a distillation as well as an exploded elaboration of ideas that had been gestating for many years. It is more difficult to track the maturation of Georgie's thought than her husband's, but with the aid of Anne Saddlemeyer's authoritative biography, we can recognize her intellectual contributions as well as her genius for organization and synthesis of the complicated data that flowed into their lives. For its editors, a vision provides opportunities to present formally the reverse miracle that Yeats saw. The published text is not finally separable from the multitudinous papers that represent its genesis. The 1925 book represents Yeats's final intentions even less than do many modern texts and is inexplicable without many details from stages of composition outside its pages. The challenge of this edition is to document its multiple sources, for a vision is both the culmination of Yeats's many years of occult study, as well as the most collaborative of his many esoteric works. 2. Crucially, a vision is the product of two Yeatses, the poet and the young Englishwoman who took his surname when she married him in the autumn of 1917. Georgie Yates is responsible for much of the system and its exposition, although it is not possible to untangle the intertwined threads of authority for any of the material. It is nonetheless certain that the philosophy that made its way into the pages, as well as its many ambiguities, have their source in the collaboration that was its raison d'etre. That collaboration began within days of the Yates's marriage in October 1917, when Georgie Yates emptied her mind as she held her pen over a sheet of paper to see whether her hand would write without conscious guidance. She was trying to salvage a near disaster. The honeymoon had been riddled with unhappiness as Yates made himself ill with anxiety over his choice of bride. <laughs> and Georgie Yates certainly hoped and intended for mediumistic communication to occur, if it were possible. The pen moved setting off the immediate genesis of a vision and the numerous texts associated with it. Although the experience was, as Yeats would later describe it, incredible, it did not arrive in a vacuum. Both Yeats and Georgie were seasoned occultists, with considerable knowledge of such areas of inquiry as astrology, Western esotericism, folk beliefs, and spiritualism. I love when academics break down occultism into its component parts, they completely bungle the effort. That's always hilarious. I mean, to say that Western esotericism is, is a an area of occultism is <laughs> sort of backwards. More like occultism is an area of Western esotericism, and folk beliefs is an area of Western esotericism. Astrology is really its own thing, and spiritualism is completely, uh, almost deserves to be its own category entirely. And yeah, well, I could get more nitpicky, but it doesn't matter. None of it matters. We're just having fun, right? The automatic writing sessions that began so abruptly was prepared for by years of study, raising the question of the degree to which it is explained by its sources in the Yeats's reading, magical practices, and other knowledge and experience. This question, of course, begs another. What levels of automaticity and volition are represented by the writing that began to flow from Georgie's hand in response to her husband's questions? In fact, the earliest scripts do not record those questions. They are lists of answers, sometimes just yes or no, to unrecorded questions or topics. Gradually, it became obvious that the revelations that were arriving would need to be kept and structured. So in order to improve efficiency and also to assist themselves in shaping the mass of automatic sessions into the order of a book, the Yeats's developed organized methods for their great experiment. They sat at a table, usually in the evenings, and perhaps after some conversation about provisional topics and some rituals such as the lighting of incense... I love that they think their preliminary ritual work would involve lighting incense. <laughs> would begin each session. George E. Yates recorded the location and time and the name of the instructor or instructors for the session. Usually an evening of automatic script would begin with a stream of writing that is not governed by the precise logic that applied to the question and answer sequences by which as Yeats later explained, quote, I had always to question and every question to rise out of a previous answer and to deal with their chosen topic. 
certainly my experience of automatic writing. After free form writing, the numbered queries and responses would begin. Sometimes Yates wrote his questions on one sheet of paper and Georgie her answers on another. Later, she wrote down both question and answer, switching psychic gears from secretary to medium with each succeeding statement. Sometimes she would act as questioner, indicating that she was doing so by initialing her query, and sometimes the communicators gave answers to both members of the couple, or to Georgie alone, as well as Yates. At extremes of her conscious participation in the receiving of information, sometimes answers appeared in mirror writing, with the letters formed in reverse so that she would presumably be prevented from knowing what she was writing, and sometimes responses to awkward questions by Yeats, some about Maud Gone, for example, oh, take a Gemini, only a Gemini like Yeats would ask his brand new wife about his old girlfriend and true love in automatic writing sessions. <laughs> I love Geminis, but I definitely never want to be with one again. Are answered st- by strongly drawn straight horizontal lines indicating refusal to reply. Frequently, George Yates drew diagrams or made lists. I was also married to a Gemini. That was, that was a choice. She was doing what contemporary spiritualists would call channeling, relaxing her conscious mind in order to be receptive to messages from outside her ordinary consciousness, and also actively participating in the joint enterprise of discovery, clarification, organization, and application of the system. In subject matter as well as method, many sessions focus on the issues of the degree to which the system is external to either of its principal investigators and how intrinsically it is associated with their conscious wills as well as subconscious desires. Much of this information was not translated from automatic script to the published book. The instructors are a part of this complicated issue. They, to some degree, mirror the levels of active control over or passive reception of the information that flowed onto the pages of the automatic script. They are of several types. Controls, who are usually named, have more or less human personalities and engage with the Yeatses as if they are third members of a conversation. Thomas of Dorlewicks, for example, stayed with them for an extended period and helped them to develop many of the system's fundamental concepts. Such later controls as Emeritus and Dionertes had distinctively different voices and areas of expertise. In addition to controls, guides are often present. These entities are more shadowy, perhaps on a more distant plane, as if levels of spiritual existence operate like links in a vast metaphysical network, and they usually have non-human names like fish or apple. The system is also guided by daemons, personal genii, or otherworldly counterparts who are enactments of concepts about which Yeats had thought and written for some time. Reincarnation is assumed, and at times ancestral or historical personages appear, sometimes wrongly, as verifiable information might confirm. The probability of error or mischief is also personified in frustrators, or spirits whose purpose like some of the fairy people of Ireland in stories with which Yeats was familiar, was to deceive or cause trouble in whatever ways they could. The Yeatses worked together on the philosophy almost daily for more than two years in a number of different locations, through events including the Great War and the Irish War of Independence, as well as the births of their two children. The web of messages also gave instruction about the Yeatses' personal lives, often intertwined strings of dialogic text in which cosmically abstract topics also speak to deeply intimate matters. The intense sessions continued until the spring of 1920, when, on an American lecture tour, the Yeatses were informed by Dionertes that he preferred other methods. Sleeps. The labor-intensive automatic writing yielded, accordingly to a method that allowed for greater discursivity and direct comment, in which, according to an entry in a notebook, Quote, Georgie speaks while asleep. Some of these sleeps were accompanied by nightmares as well as inconvenient and sometimes unsettling phenomena during the day, such as the smells of flowers, burnt wax or incense, or the sounds of whistles, animals, or human voices. By April 1921, Yates recorded in a notebook that all communication by external means, sleeps, 
whistles, voices, renounced as too exhausting for Georgie, when pregnant with their second child. Philosophy is now coming in a new way, Yeats wrote. I am getting it in sleep, and when half awake, and Georgie has correspondential dreams or visions. They also recorded talks or conversations, so that as a late record, typed probably by Georgie, notes, quote, since we have gave up the sleeps, we have worked at the system by discussion, each bringing to these their discoveries. The revelations gradually grew from stray words written in awkwardly large, rounded handwriting by a pen not lifted from the page except to end at the end of lines, to information recorded in automatic answers to recorded questions, to a barrage of material invading the Yates's waking and sleeping lives, an experience that encompassed much of their time and, and creative energy. As readers of this edition, we will see from the notes to the text the Yeats's system has a number of precursors and influences. Both Yeats and Georgie were adepts in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, quote, the crowning glory of the occult revival in the 19th century, a magical society that stressed the mastery of a body of knowledge that has been called the Philosophia Perennis. They read widely in Neoplatonic, Kabbalist, alchemical, Rosicrucian, Hermetic, Theosophic, and Wisdom literature, from Agrippa through A.E. Waite, through such writers as Blavatsky, Burma, Dante's Convito, Hermes Trismegistus, Elephas Levy, G.R.S. Mead, S.L. McGregor Mathers, Ptolemy, Pico della Mirandola, Plato, Plotinus, and Swedenborg. Blake is a particularly important literary precursor, not only for ideas, but also for the concrete example Blake presented of another poet who created his own mythographic system that joined imaginative and spiritual truth working in concert with his wife. In some respects, a vision takes its place among other romantic fragments and literary hoaxes, participating in the popularity of antiquity and orientalized otherness in English poetry, as well as literary Celticism, from Macpherson to Fiona MacLeod, whose alter ego, the writer William Sharp, was a friend of Yeats's. Nor are texts, whether philosophical or belletristic, the only underpinnings for the system. Both Yeats and Georgie were active astrologers. They also read tarot cards, practiced divination, and studied numerology. Yeats, in particular, had attended a number of seances and studied psychic occurrences from ghost stories to religious miracles. Automatic writing itself was far from new to them. A number of 19th and early 20th century spiritualists used the technique, notably among them William Stanton Moses, one of the founders of the Society of Psychical Research, to which organization Yeats belonged from 1913 to 1928. As recently as 1912 and 1913, Yeats had studied the automatic writing of a young medium named Elizabeth Radcliffe and written an essay about her. Yeats's oeuvre is perhaps the best preparation for a reader of the 1925 A Vision, as it was for its authors. His occult essays like the well-known Magic, 1901, the magical stories written for The Secret Rose, the Cahullin plays, especially The Hawk's Well, and the two essays and notes composed for the inclusion in Lady Gregory's visions and beliefs in the west of Ireland, particularly Swedenborg, Mediums, and the Desolate Places, are all essential reading. Two essays that remained unpublished during the Yeats's lifetimes are thematically and formally related to a vision, an experiment with assuming the voice of the anti-self, Leo Africanus, in the form of letters to and from a historical character and writer recreated as a mythic opposite, and an essay written in 1916 in dialogue form between two personae on the topic of masks entitled The Poet and the Actress. All of these sources pale in comparison with the two essays that comprise Per Amica Silentia Lune, a slim monograph published in 1916 that represents the furthest development of Yeats's thought prior to his marriage and the advent of the automatic experiments. Per Amica is mentioned frequently in the automatic script notes and drafts, and it also blends the personal and abstract in its context as well as its form. Yeats admits in the introduction to the utterly transformed 1937 edition of A Vision, in which he tells the story of the automatic script openly, that, 
Quote, the unknown writer took his theme at first from my just published Per Amica Silentia Lune. In fact, the themes of the automatic script in the first scripts that the Yeats has preserved include the idea of opposites found in Plato's Phaedrus, given to Yeats on a scrap of paper from his friend W.T. Horton, and also in an automatic script produced by Lady Edith Littleton in 1914. Leo Africanus, now not an anti-self but a frustrator, also appears. Antitheses characterize the script, and it was perhaps to be expected that they dominate the form as well as the content of the book in its early states of composition. At Zenni, you get the same quality frame and lens options that you'd get from an optician for one-tenth of the price, including blue blockers, progressives, prescription sunglasses, and more. The best part? Try on any frame, anywhere, with our 3D virtual try-on. Zenni.com. Eyewear for everyone. Who are you texting? My therapist. You text with your therapist? Text, video chat, call? Yep. That sounds too easy. How did you find her? I just went to betterhelp.com slash save. She's a licensed therapist and it's all online. I connect when it's convenient for me and don't waste time driving anywhere. Plus, it's affordable. I wonder if I should try it. It's great to talk to someone in confidence. She's helped me sort out quite a few things. And right now you save 10% off the first month when you go through betterhelp.com slash save. Betterhelp.com slash save. Got it. Three. Yeats had begun to compose the dialogues between Ahern and Robartes that comprise the first drafts of the book very early in the reception of the automatic messages, perhaps indeed as early as 21 November 1917, when he asks for corroboration of system-related ideas in my essay. Georgie had suggested, and Yeats had accepted, the fictional author Geraldus for his essay or book probably in December 1917. He wrote to Lady Gregory in early January 1918 of the very profound, very exciting, mystical philosophy coming in strange ways to Georgie and myself. He continued, It is coming into my work a great deal and makes me feel that for the first time I understand human life. I am writing it all out in a series of dialogues about a supposed medieval book, The Speculum Angelorum et Hominum by Geraldus and a sect of Arabs called the Judualis Diagrammatists. Ross has helped me with the Arabic. I live with a strange sense of revelation and never know what the day will bring. You will be astonished at the change in my work, at its intricate passion. Three days after posting the letter to Lady Gregory, Yeats wrote to Edmund Dulac, who was in on the joke, to say that Every evening the speculum of Geraldus becomes more engrossing. I am more and more astonished at the profundity of that learned author and at the neglect into which he has fallen, a neglect only comparable to that which has covered with moss the of oblivion the even more profound work of Custa Ibn Luca of Baghdad, whose honor remains alone in the obscure sect of the Judwalis. The first mention of Geraldus in the automatic script occurs on 12th January 1918 in a session that contains a reference to the two books we invented and a warning, one of many, against deliberate reading, presumably to buttress the ideas of the system. It was not until the first of vision was being drastically revised for its second version that Yeats was encouraged to fit the wisdom of this myth into larger intellectual currents. So it's important to keep in mind that They didn't have the entertainment we have today. There was no video games. They didn't really even have movies that much. I mean, very limitedly. They had plays, of course, and operas that were very popular. But your evenings often were alone with your writings and your letters. And and people lived in a very different mental state. I know because I was raised in that mental state. My evenings were composed of writing letters to friends around the world and reading whatever books I could get my hands on. There was no internet. There was no, no anything like... If you couldn't get friends together to play Dungeons and Dragons, you were alone. And I think that's what you're seeing a lot with Yeats was they would come up with these narrative and stories and and conceits and and games and create fictional characters and have that interweave with their actual lives in in really remarkable ways. They would take a long time to develop. But this was uh, aesthetics. This was creativity. And um, we have sadly 
not lost that, but it has changed dramatically to the extent that it's hard to imagine you or I writing letters to each other and putting a great deal of time into a fictional author that we're making up and then talking to other people about them, then maybe even writing a book under their name, but having that influence a real work that we ourselves are doing in earnest. Like that kind of literary aesthetic cool conceit is the kind of thing that it's going to it's going to tickle you on the late nights of sitting in front of candle flames in your country village or or downtown apartment in Paris or London that's that's what you got unless you're the type of person who just wanted to go out and and get drunk in the city this is what you had if you were a, an intellectual or aesthete or creative type and it's quite it's quite hilarious when you when you do get the joke as was perhaps inevitable, given that he was writing while information was still being received and engaging in many other activities, whether personal, literary, theatrical, or political, the next year saw Yeats working and often reworking as new information arrived as, or as he was able to synthesize or understand details received earlier, and being sure at many points that he was nearly finished. He announced to Dulac on October 1923 that he was within I hope another month of completion. In February 1924, he revised his schedule. Quote, certain new editions of my work, which I have had to correct the proofs for, have delayed the philosophy, but I expect that another month will finish the manuscript. Finally, a year later, on 23rd April 1925, he sent Dulac a definitive announcement. Yesterday, I finished the book. In order to give a sense of the complexity of Yeats's work during those years, we offer the following list, which contains a provisional chronology of the less fragmentary and more significant of the often undateable manuscripts and typescripts that represent stages of composition of a vision, along with dates and composition and publication of relevant literary volumes for this period. Now, the chart and the, well, the charts and lists and information that follow is not very useful to listen to, in my opinion, so that can be uh, skipped. Moving on to four and the end of this introduction by the editors. The reader, leafing through the stiff pages of a vision, encountered a book that attempts to explain all that exists or can be imagined, and these two are the same according to the system. It's very Steiner, the idea that imagination has such a pride of place here. The multiplicity may be expressed by means of a single fundamental thought, as Yeats asserts in a note to the poem The Second Coming from the notes at the back of the Kula Press volume Michael Rabartes and the Dancer, quote, The mind, whether expressed in history or in the individual life, has a precise movement, which can be quickened or slackened, but cannot be fundamentally altered, and this movement can be expressed by a mathematical form. A supreme religious act of the Judualis' faith is to fix the attention on the mathematical form of this movement until the whole past and future of humanity, or of an individual man, shall be present to the intellect as if it were accomplished in a single moment. The intensity of the beatific vision when it comes, depends upon the intensity of this realization. A central symbol is expressed in two ways, as a wheel, in two dimensions, and as a double cone, in three. Both are always moving. Change and opposition, in predetermined pattern, is the theme. One phase yields to another. Faculties and principles all have their opposites and corners. Souls spin forward and backward through lives and after lives. Eras in human history and movements in art and thought push toward and repel their own opposites. The whole is not fatalistic, as the note to the second coming continues, because the mathematical figure is an expression of the mind's desire. The Yeats has created and counter-created their evocative system out of their own mind's desire. At the turbulent beginning of their personal relationship, the Irish Free State and the conflicts between political movements that became larger markers of a century marked by change and violence. Both co-authors are immediately present, despite the text's air of mystery. Georgie's ideas can be traced from this book backward through the genetic material upon which a vision relies heavily. Ironically, 
given that in this vision she is not mentioned by name, she is more present in this text as a silent co-author than in the later edition. By the time the later edition came to be written, Yeats had been encouraged to add to the private system various philosophical contexts that additional reading and study made available to him. In A Vision 2, and again, ironically, given the rhetorical impression of uncertainty rather than authorial command to this material, this text expresses with immediacy Yeats's views from one of his most important periods. For example, in the 1925 book shows Yeats's attitudes toward international modernism during the Velta of its most intense decade, and without the distance of the vision from the 1930s, as he remarks in the pages at the end of Dove or Swan that were excised from the later edition, this phase is, quote, It is said, the first where there is hatred of the abstract, where the intellect turns upon itself, Mr. Ezra Pound, Mr. Eliot, Mr. Joyce, Signor Pirandello, who either eliminate from metaphor the poet's fantasy and substitute a strangeness discovered by historical or contemporary research, or who break up the logical processes of thought by flooding them with associated ideas or words that seem to drift into the mind by chance. A vision also puts such aesthetics in close proximity with Yeats's early interests in Italian fascism. In the same later omitted passage, Yeats writes that because myth and fact have fallen apart, decadence will ensue, and afterward a new era will arise characterized by organic groups, covens of physical or intellectual kin. Quote, I imagine new races, as it were, seeking domination, a world resembling but for its immensity that of the Greek tribes, each with its own diamond or ancestral hero, the brood of Leda, war and love. History grown symbolic, the biography changed into a myth. Yeats had in common with Mussolini his desire to infuse actual world events with the power of myth, and it is significant that a vision shares a publication date with the first English edition of Margarita Sarfati's biography of Mussolini, a book with a much larger readership than a vision, but sh which shares with it a conflation of fascism and myth. Sarfati's book was largely responsible for cementing the myth of Il Duce, that would be so important to Mussolini's status in Italy. Yeats's interest in fascism continued to develop after the first printing of a vision, as his reading in fascist philosophy and awareness of international fascist movements expanded. A vision captures an idealistic moment in his investment in fascism, moderately shaped by the writings of fascist thinkers and the thinking of Ezra Pound, but mostly based in myth. By 1937, when a vision the later edition was published, his sense of this relationship had shifted, so he removed many of these passages. While the later edition still contains traces of his faith in many of the doctrines of fascism, its elitism, its anti-liberalism, its corporativism, it also hints at uncertainty about whether the fascist experiment can succeed. No doubt. In a new concluding section to Dove or Swan, dated 1934-36, to he refers to the central fascist figure of speech to ask, What discords will drive Europe to that artificial unity? Only dry or drying sticks can be tied into a bundle, which is the decadence of every civilization. He fears the death that must attend the unity of fascism, the fascio or a bundle of rods, and an axe that had become the symbol of Italian fascism. This idea of organic groups, covens of physical or intellectual kin, is largely absent from the 1937 version of A Vision, and is an example of how interpretation may not only move forward in time to see Yeats's changing thought, but also back in order to see that his political reading was not Georgie's. Covens were discussed at length in a number of sleeps, as intersections between individual minds and imagined communities. The interests of the younger partner in the experiments may be inferred from discussions in which the spirits tried to limit covens to, quote, an interaction between the places of the self and CG, creative genius, thus expressing a relationship between creativity and self that is more like the effort to break up 
the logical processes of thought by flooding them with associated ideas or words that seem to drift into the mind by chance, which Yeats deplores in his description of modernist writing quoted above. Then, like Yeats's dismay at such effort, the creative genius is the term from William Blake and uh, definitely played a role in the developing of the idea of the higher genius. There is an echo of Yeats's poem, Michael Rabartes and the Dancer, a discussion between an older man certain of his opinion about modernity and a younger woman who does not share them in a sleep from 29th November 1920. If a coven is not in contact with the memory of the opposite coven through its dragon, its thought is empty. It is because the spiritualist coven loses contact with the psychological memory of its opposite that is, it is so stupid. The coven is a mechanism, of, and without the opposite memory, the mechanism has nothing to work on. This process has nothing to do with diamonds or guides, and is a condition of all fruitful thought. A vision is a linchpin for informed readings of the developing thought of both Yeats and Georgie, their phantasmagoric contribution that is this book, insisting on instability and symbol, has an enduring interest, and it is to be hoped that readers of this edition may encounter, as Yeats wrote, such thought that in it bound I need no other thing, wound in minds wandering as mummies in the mummy cloth are wound. 5. The creators of a vision knew that it was both finished and incomplete, like all books, but to a considerably greater extent than most others. It announces the need for a revision in its opening pages. Its rhetoric throughout is characterized by hesitation, as well as poses that claim of certitude. The book is a beautiful artifact, but hardly an accurate text, and it has never been reset or corrected. Instead, it was replaced by the 1937 Macmillan Trade publication. The current edition presupposes integrity for the 1925 text, rather than treating it as a quirky predecessor for the improved 1937 edition. As has often happened in the history of the two very different books entitled A Vision by W.B. Yeats, we agree with the notion of versioning, as defined by Donald Ryman. He writes that it is both more useful and more efficient to provide critics and students with complete texts of two or more different stages of a literary work, each of which can be read as an integral whole, than to chop all but one version into small pieces and then mix and sprinkle these dismembered fragments at the bottoms of pages or shuffle them at the back of the book as tables of variants or collations. On a theoretical level, producing these two versions allows us, in George Bornstein's words, an interesting middle ground between stable, unitary notions of the text on the one hand and post-structuralist free play of endless deferral on the other. Given that the two printed versions were in W.B. Yeats's mind part of a single process of composition, it is important to delineate where one volume stops and the other begins. Our A Vision volume focuses on the book as it was published in 1925, reserving for the later version revisions made toward a later printing, as well as explanations of contextual material that relates primarily to the later book, such as the prominent role of Western philosophy buttressing its arguments. However, those changes intended as corrections as opposed to revisions of a vision are treated in annotations in an appendix to this volume, Sadly, all of it's done in endnotes, and endnotes is the death of academia. I don't know why anyone uses endnotes. Everything should be in footnotes, if noted at all, in which we present textual corrections made by Georgie and Yeats after the publication of the 1925 text, but not necessarily incorporated into the 1937 printing. As Richard J. Finneran has noted, three of the four copies of A Vision in Yeats's library contain markings by Yeats and Georgie, many of which were not adopted in the 1937 printing. Their appropriate place is in annotations and tables of variants. We have also drawn on the letters between Yeats and Frank Pierce Sturm, a poet, scholar, and mystic, noting in annotations Sturm's corrections to W.B. Yeats's Latin, his understanding of the movement of the moon, 
and his knowledge of the language in which Cicero wrote. Where they were incorporated into the later version, they will be printed there as primary text. Thus, our text of a vision freezes the moment of its publication, with annotations suggesting some links between it and the later. There's a lot of abbreviations that I changed to actual words in this uh, reading for you all, so that's where sometimes I stumble because they just use a lot of academic abbreviations, which I then turn into full words. This volume differs significantly from others in the Collected Works series, which follow closely the principle of final and expressed authorial intentions. While this principle will determine the editorial choices made for a vision, the later version and of this one, must be understood as a version rooted in the historical moment of 1925. To extend it into the future is to move it toward or into the later version. Our focus on the T. Werner Lorry printed text as copy text rather than attempting to posit authorial intention beyond its pages or synthesize an ideal text also follows from instabilities in the concept of authorial intention. Although this idea has a distinguished history in the field of scholarly editing, it is less meaningful for a vision than for many texts, if only because of the complex collaboration that was its genesis. For these reasons, we have made this volume a first presentation edition, adhering closely to the text as printed by T. Werner Lorry in its limited edition. As a part of our endeavor to present this text as published in 1925, we have retained most of the front matter of that edition, including its frontispiece and title page, which contains references to texts by Giraldus and Custa ben Luca, all of which combine to insinuate that the book is not truly authored so much as compiled by William Butler Yeats. This edition is not a facsimile edition, however, and as such it presents the opportunity for small corrections and standardizations, work for which the 1925 version seems to cry out. The copia of misprints, textual errors, and lack of standardization in a vision is well known to scholars familiar with that text. One need look no further than the descriptions of the phases in the 28 embodiments to see the kind of variations in capitalization, abbreviation, and italicization that riddle the 1925 text. Each phase has at the beginning of its description a summary of its characteristics, divided into will, mask, creative mind, and body of fate. That's what I primarily focused on in my early uh, workshops on his the vision system, and I did work from a uh, copy I got in London in 1997 near the British Library of a very old early edition, and I never read the later edition, so I look forward to uh, doing that. I did compile a lot of notes from the later edition, but didn't read it in its ent- t- entirety, um, because uh, what can I say? I was 19 and teaching 20 adults uh, something that no one had taught them before, which was how Yeats's system might work within the Golden Dawn system. When the summary notes relationships to other phases, the number of the phase is, over the course of the section, given as P14, phase 14, phase 14, and phase 14. Yeah, to hear that and not see it is weird, huh? <laughs> in this case, we have regularized all phase references in this section to phase 14, as that is the predominant style. Similarly, we have regularized other formatting presented in tables, section headings, and phase headings, as these parts of the text seem to be designed with regularity in mind. Likewise, we have corrected the spelling of proper names. We have also corrected the misnumbering of section headings that begins on page 82, page 68 in this edition. Similarly, and for the ease of distinction between our endnotes and Yeats's footnotes, we have regularized the reference mark for Yeats's own notes to an asterisk, although in a couple of instances the copy text uses a 1 instead. All of the changes above are listed in the table of emendations at the end of this volume, but two categories of changes to punctuation are made silently. We have standardized quotation marks and removed occasional italicization of semicolons. Capitalization and italicization of terms is also wildly variable in a vision. For the most part, we have retained the capitalization and italicization found in the copy text in order to retain the impression that a vision would have given its original readers.
The main exception is the body of terminology that is particular to a vision and crucial to an understanding of the Yeats's system. At a late stage of proofs, Yeats himself attempted to standardize the capitalization and italicization of technical terms. Throughout the text, readers are often reminded that these are precise technical terms, and we have honored that aim by standardizing the capitalization and italicization of the following terms, anima hominis, anima mundi, antithetical, diamond, fall, great wheel, great ear, head, heart, loins, phase, when referring to a specifically numbered phase, and lowercase phase when being used generically, primary, and the four principles, celestial body, husk, passionate body, spirit, and true and false when they are used with respect to faculties. Will, one of the four faculties, body of fate, creative mind, mask, and will, is not regularized with others, since Yeats also uses the word will in its ordinary sense, and it is not always clear whether he refers to the common concept or the specialized term. We have yielded to the authority of the copy text for this word. All students of a vision will continue to rely heavily on the important edition with its extensive introduction and notes. George Mills Harper and Walter Kelly Hood, its editors, presented the text in facsimile, a fact that left the text uncorrected but gives readers the opportunity now to examine both this reset text and also a photostat of the original Lori edition. This edition does not hope to supplant so much as complement CVA, and we have used Harper and Hood extensively, often borrowing without major change from their notes. However, our notes can take advantage of scholarly advances since the publication, foremost among which is the four-volume edition of the Vision Papers, YVP, of which Harper was the general editor when AVA, a vision, refers directly to AS, the automatic script, or other documents, as it does with significant frequency, our notes direct readers, when possible, to YVP. Among other editions of WB Yeats, note should be made of, special, of the special case of the mythologies, whose collected occult texts are often relevant to a vision. Although the collected works edition of that text to be edited by Jonathan Allison has yet to be published, there are two existing editions. The first, published by Macmillan in 1959, is unannotated and has not been recently re-edited, but it has the advantage of being widely available. Warwick Gold and Deirdre Toomey published in 2005 an impressive scholarly edition with Palgrave, an edition that is rich with annotations but not as common as the other, wishing to present readers with as many possibilities for further reading as possible, as we have presented references to both in our annotations. Still paying hundreds of dollars for prescription glasses? Let's change that. At Zenni.com, our factory direct model means no middlemen or outrageous markups. Just the same quality frames and lens options as the other guys, for one-tenth the price. Zenni offers prescription glasses starting at $6.95, as well as affordable sunglasses, blue blockers, and more. The best part? Try any frame, anywhere, with our 3D virtual try-on. Visit Zenni.com today and change the way you buy glasses forever.